and we just traveled um, in the car with my husband and yeah. when it was visible, but I couldn't see anything. <laughs> Yeah, people, people are gathering. Yeah, when did you want? So you said we wait five minutes just to let people. Yeah, yeah, I think we can wait five minutes and okay. uh, after we can start. Usually, even uh, we do this in live, uh, in in the in the room, uh, and yeah. then we usually always wait the five minutes. <laughs> Have you invited invited people? I have, yeah. I posted the the post that you gave that you had um, on Facebook. I shared that one, and I don't remember. I think I put something on LinkedIn, and there were a bunch of people who were interested, like friends, where I sent the link on WhatsApp and and everything. So, and some of them, like I said, they're in different countries, so they'll probably go watch the YouTube video. Um, just because yeah, time difference is just <laughs> too bad for this one. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people uh, usually, you know, when they can't uh, uh, participate on the on the seminar, and they are really happy when uh, I tell I tell them that they, yeah, it's on the YouTube. You can watch it. And it's so nice to have like a. I mean, you're inviting all these people, and they're giving all these good talks. It's nice to have somewhere with all the talks because you can go back to them. So it's uh I think it's a really cool idea. For our um ecology seminars, I don't think that we have uh well there we go. I don't think that we have somewhere where we put the presentations at all. Which is mm -hmm. a shame because then I mean, you know, months after you're like, oh, I remember mm -hmm. this person working on that. It's uh I wish I could have their contact, but I don't remember who it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe there is an ecological seminar in Avesta. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I remember that maybe once I was there, and there was two people from Germany about yeah. the, the the wolves. It was more uh, about the social um, yeah, yeah, yeah conflicts and and everything like that. I think there were like at some point we had three seminars in a row that were about wolves or about social behavior and and then there was the new PhD student um, Erica von Nessen that was doing more of a social social science study on wolves and wild boars I think it was mm. it was really cool I mean it was super nice. And uh, she doing this in Norway, or she is. I think she is supposed to be based in Evenstad, but living in Hamar or something. She's yeah, associated if you with. Want uh, something with the white boars? Then it's the south part. Right. Yeah. Norway. Yeah. I'm not. I don't remember what her study area was. I don't. Maybe it was like the whole of Norway, even. But um, it was a very cool subject for sure. Yeah, what is her name? I just want to. Erika von Essen. So E R I C A. Oh, I, oh, I know this name. Right? I mean, she came to campus yeah. a couple of times when you were there, I think. Yes, 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 yes. I know. She's um, a blonde. She was so... in Wolves Across Borders, also, I think. Yeah, yeah she's, yeah, blonde. Mm. she's blonde and have short hairs. I hair, think so, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I know her. Mm. Dark with her, I think. I <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know her. Yeah, she was on the Volvo Focus Boris. Yeah. At the Skandard meeting that we just did in Sweden, there were a lot of people from, uh, not just the scientists, but like a lot of the managers uh, from Wolves Across Borders. So everyone was kind of meeting each other again after, you know, <laughs> six months or something. It was nice. Both well, across borders, it will be at the uh, uh, Netherlands. The, the next one, when it will yeah. be. Um, they said it was going to be June 2025 or May 2025. Um, and that right now the organizing committee is uh, from the Netherlands. I don't That's remember if it was Netherlands and Belgium, but it's supposed to be held in the Netherlands. 
Mm, yeah. Try to be there. Yeah, <laughs> we were gonna ask um, Amy who the organizing committee is, so we can already be like, hey, I would like to volunteer <laughs> in two years. But <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. Yeah. I think the first one was it was really well organized. Everyone loved it, and yeah, all the work you did with the volunteers was just amazing. I mean, it was great. It was so cool, and it was the first of mm -hmm. it. Nice. And there will be another conference near uh, in the near f uh, future for wolves or. Yeah, something, some kind of wildlife, wildlife conference. But yeah, mentioned it. Uh, it's gonna be in uh, Lillehammer, I think, also in 2025. Uh, Barbara and Georgia are, are organizing. It. Um, it's like the IUGB and three other conferences that are put into one. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's gonna be super nice. I I would attend that one. But it's also oh. in 2025. <laughs> I think I can be there, but yeah, in Lillehammer, wait, it's a price. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think one more minute and mm -hmm. we can start. <clears throat> nice. You'll have to tell me if um, I have a few, like a couple of videos. If uh, if those work okay, I think I should see it. I mean, I have the second screen, but uh, just in case. I think uh, it's it's always good. So uh, on Zoom, there wasn't any problem like this with yeah. videos or something. So I think it will be right. Okay. Okay, I think you can start, or we yeah. can start. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I should introduce you. I always so bad with introducing the president. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Laura Nikolai. She is uh, now from uh, the US, but uh, she uh, is a PhD student uh, of the Evanstad campus in, in Norway, the Inland University of Applied Sciences. And um, and, and and I just, just give the the word to her because it will be really nice <laughs> thank presentation, you, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm super excited to be able to present our project and my PhD today. So thank you all for coming to listen. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so my name is Laura. Um, I have been working on many species, both in uh, wildlife. I've had many species of squirrels, roe deer, moose, wolves, and bears. And then more recently, I started working with free-ranging cattle. Um, and we'll, of course, get more into that. And my studies have taken me a bit all over the world, which has been uh, really nice in terms of diverse projects. Um, I'm currently working uh, through my PhD. I'm a bit more than halfway at the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences. And I'm working in a project called carnivore graze or grazing in carnivore forests. Um, in Norway, livestock, so that's cattle and sheep and some goats, but mostly cattle and sheep are usually left to free range during the summer season because the fields need to be used to produce the winter feed. And they usually have no fences, they have no shepherds, they have no livestock guarding dogs which are the usual protection systems uh, for farmers to use for their animals when they're free ranging. And so with this in mind, in this project, we seek to understand the conflict between these free ranging livestock and the wolves and the bears that inhabit the same regions where they're at. And we're working in the only zone where wolves are allowed to live in Norway, which puts an immense pressure on farmers that live there. And in this map, you can see that the zone where, so the green zone is where the wolves are allowed to live and breed. And it's considerably shrunk throughout the years, going from the whole of Norway, basically, to a small region in the southeast uh, at the border with Sweden. So in our study, we have packs that are um, neighboring, you know, Norway and Sweden. And so sheep farmers, they, they tend in general to have a lot more depredation um, 
uh, than cattle, especially in our region. And that's why we wanted to explore whether cattle could make an acceptable alternative to sheep farming in this region or not. They're bigger, they're better at defending themselves when free ranging. Um, and we can talk more about um, some countries have seen that wolves change from going after sheep to going after cattle when they change this, but we'll talk more about this at the end. Um, and so in this project, we explore three different things. We want to explore what are the consequences of putting cattle in the forest, free ranging with carnivores present? Are they stressed by the carnivores? Do they encounter them often? How often is that? And what are the consequences of it? We also want to take a look um, and make sure to explore whether cattle have any impact on the forest that we put them in, as these forests are often managed for wood production in Norway. And in this project, we also take a look at whether cattle impact the biodiversity of plants and pollinators in areas where they are released. And so I work within uh, this carnivore cattle aspect. And I think I will first show you uh, the tools that we've been using. And then we will go through my PhD objectives uh, in a bit more detail and our newest experiment that we've been um, that we've been doing. So we've been working with um, multiple tools to allow us to explore my main three objectives as it can be very difficult to monitor these herds. They're not out in just pastures. They are uh, navigating through very rugged terrain in very dense forests and they're, they can just be very hard to follow. And so <clears throat> one of the tools that we've been working with um, is called virtual fencing through the No Fence Company. This virtual fence is communicated through GPS signals to the animal's collar. So the farmer is able to just set the boundaries of a fence. And if the animal approaches the boundary of this invisible fence, then the collar makes a noise that's followed by a small electric shock if it's not respected, like if the cow doesn't turn around like in the video. And this shock is really, really inferior to the shock that they would get from a normal electric fence. So that's one of our tools. Another tool that we've been using is called accelerometry through the use of, the use of an accelerometer. It's a small device made up of axis-based motion sensing. So you can study uh, movement through one or several axes. And we're using three different axes. We're using up and down, forward, backwards, and side to side. Um, and it's really commonly used every day to identify orientation. So if you take your phone, for example, when you use a compass on your phone, it knows the direction where you're pointing your phone. Um, or if you if you decide to change the orientation from portrait to landscape on your phone, it's the same thing. And this can be applied to collect remote information on both domesticated and wildlife species, which is really convenient. And the no fence collar that I just mentioned has all three functionalities. It has GPS, it allows us to see where our, co our cows are. We have the virtual fence and we have this accelerometry um, uh, movement data. And another tool that uh, we've been, oh, can you see the video or no? There mm -hmm. we go. Um, we are using biosensors. So our biosensors from Star OD record heart rate and temperature, and they allow us to have very precise data while the cattle are out roaming, uh, free ranging in the forest, which is also very convenient. So heart rate and temperature. As of now, we've been collaborating with seven farmers in Norway, and we've collected data on about 150 different cows of six different breeds. Um, and every summer, all adults are collared with these no fence collars. And depending on the year, we have equipped 10 to 20 cows with biosensors. And we've been doing this over three years, and we just got extended in the project. So we'll have one last field season uh, this summer. We work in four main areas uh, with different landscapes in Norway. The two areas in the north, let me get the pointer. Can you see the pointer? The two areas in the north um, 
are supposed to be carnivore free as they are not in the wolf zone. They're just a bit north of the wolf zone. But we have had proof of carnivore presence, although in very low density through feces and sightings and things like that. But the two areas, um, these two areas, um, <clears throat> are in wolf and bear territory, and we have wolves and bears collared in those areas. So we can have uh, more information on actual encounters between the carnivores that are collared and our cattle that are in this area. And so now on to my objectives. So in my first one, um, I wanted to explore the relationship between behavior and ex accelerometry and accelerometry and physiology. And for this, we needed to create tools to interpret this movement data that I talked about uh, from our callers and match them either to behavioral data through videos or to physiological data through the heart rate that we get through the biosensors. We have managed to find the relationship between behavior and accelerometry. And this was published uh, earlier this year, so feel free to go check it out. Um, and I'm currently working on the physiological thing, so matching this acceleration to the physiological data. And this would kind of allow us to put these colors out on our cows and get all three types of data. We would get accelerometry, GPS, heart rate, just from the colors. We wouldn't need to put biosensors. We wouldn't need to put uh, people out in the field to film these cows. So it would be just very, very convenient. We did create a comics version of our paper for better science communication to larger audiences, and it is available in five languages. Um, I will put a link to my LinkedIn at the end of this presentation, and it's all on there or on my research gate, so you'll you'll be able to have access to these. So for my second objective, um, we want to look specifically at what happens during encounters with carnivores. Um, and see how they affect the behavior and the physiology the physiology of cattle with the, the tools that we create in the first objective. I currently have a master's uh, student that's working on the behavioral aspect of this question. She's going to be looking at the GPS data and determining differences in speed, in linearity of movement, in the distance moved, um, and potential displacement, spatial displacement before and after encounters. And it was really interesting to us that we did not have that many encounters, but that is something that we can also discuss after there's um, quite some limitations um, on this kind of study, just because collaring carnivores in the same areas as we have cows is a difficult task. And this is why I'm going to talk about my third objective. As we didn't think that we had enough carnivores encounters in this project to uh, quantified the consequences uh, on the behavior and physiology of cows, we thought that we could do experimental approaches on our cows. And that's how the virtual cow project was born within carnivore graves. So just to get like a summary, within carnivore graves, we had already focused on the detection of real c cattle carnivore encounters in the forest. We published the article matching accelerometry to behavior, I'm working on the physiological link. And now we wanted to put our intention, attention to be sure to have enough data um, on these experimental approaches. And with both of these, the idea is if we can identify behavioral and physiological patterns during stressful events, we can maybe work with the programming team of NoFence, which is the company for the, the callers that we're using, to create this alert system that would warn the farmers that something stressful is going on and it would be wise to check on the cows. And we've even talked, and this is just an idea at this point, but we've even talked about somehow incorporating speakers that would broadcast human voices while the cows are in the stressful situation. But uh, more studies would be needed on this. But um, it's, it's a very nice applied uh, tool that would be able to be created through this. For these approaches, we use two farms. So um, one with Hefwald on the left side and one with Shawade cows. And the Hefwald cows are known as being a lot more tame, a lot more friendly than their counterpart, uh, which is a lot more wild and protective of their young. And both of 
uh, of these are beef cattle. Uh, for the carnivores, we took a stuffed bear and a stuffed wolf and had them uh, placed on a radio controlled cart. This is usually used by hunters in Norway to train their dogs on how to react to different animals. Um, you can do it with, uh, with bear. Wolf is usually not used, but moose, lynx, wild boar, all of these can also be used. And with this visual, we also used uh, scents. So we would get fresh pelts of bears and wolves and rub them on the, 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 stuffed, uh, the stuffed ones. And in addition to the carnivores, we also presented just the radio controlled cart with nothing on it, a hunting dog with a person. And these hunting dogs were selected to resemble wolves. Um, so not a golden retriever, but we had a Norwegian elk hound and a, a Swedish Yemtern that, that look a bit more like wolves. And then a control where nothing happened. And so this was our kind of setup, our experimental, our experimental setup. All stimuli were presented to the cows uh, on a dirt road that followed the field with a pause in the middle. <clears throat> and now for a few videos, um, we'll start with the bear. In the first one, you can see that the bear and the wolf was doing the same thing, are doing these random attacks on their path. Um, and I will show you the differences in between the two farms because there seems to be a breed difference for sure. And in this uh, in this farm, the cow seems very aware of the bear and came to investigate. And in the next video, um, it's only when they got when they caught the scent of the bear that they started to kind of panic. And some of them have already left, but then there was a movement of running away from the bear. So scent, I mean, keep keep that in mind. Um, our second farm here had a lot more intense reaction. Um, we had more of a stampede <laughs> uh, event with these cows and you'll see some of these are still checking out the bear um, at the end, but most of them were running and the youngs were being kept away. For the wolf, we were very surprised of the reaction that we were getting. In the first farm, they the cows were even letting the calves approach uh, the wolf. There was no real panic reaction. Um, and this is very interesting. I'll talk more about the, their reaction to hunting dogs because they, they can make the difference between both. Um, and in this one, so the wolf will appear from behind here and slowly come all, um, it's, it's right here for now. So you can follow the wolf. In this one, the reaction was also very surprising. These cows had a back and forth approach. They would confront the wolf, which is now right here, and investigate what it was doing. And then as a whole group, start running like this. And then as a whole group, they would go back and check out the wolf. I mean, it was it was this back and forth uh, pattern during the whole trial. There was a lot of vocalization. There was a lot of keeping the calves away. So that was also very interesting. With a preliminary look at our data, it seems like the cattle took longer to settle down after the carnivore stimuli than the non-carnivore ones. And for the dogs, for example, what I was talking about is they were extremely confrontational. And if there was no fence, um, I think it would have been a bit dangerous for the dog. So they can make the difference between a wolf and a dog. For the dog, they are extremely confrontational. And for the wolf, they just did not have a, a, a big reaction. So that was interesting. Uh, scent seemed to play a very important role in recognizing potential danger, which we expect in. Um, our hypothesis is kind of like um, cows will be exposed to feces and urine of carnivores in the forest more than actual carnivores uh, encounters just because the density of these carnivores is so low. And finally, we had a lot of running behavior, which is great because in the paper that we just published, we were lacking this behavior. We didn't have enough individuals. We didn't have enough videos of these running cows. Um, and from this experiment, it seems, and also that was recognized in literature, it seems like uh, vigilance time and running time seem to be the two behaviors that would indicate a stressful 
event happening to these cattle. And so with my objectives, we should be able to get a better understanding of how carnivores impact um, the behavior and the physiology of cows. And on top of that, we could create this alert system to warn farmers when stressful encounters are happening to their cows, uh, which could potentially help in decreasing uh, conflict between these. And there's still many things to do within our project, but I really look forward to seeing what comes up and hopefully you do too. Um, there we go. I think I went a bit fast, but that's okay. Um, I'd like to thank you for listening and take any questions you might have. Here are all of our partners, which I want to thank. Um, and in addition, so you can get my LinkedIn with all of the comics and, and a lot of information on, on what I've been doing. We also have this YouTube documentary. It's a 20 minute documentary that was made by one of our students on our field work. We have interviews of people in the project. It explains more of the context of the project and how we do actual field work. And then we have our current for Gray's website where you can find a lot of updates on what we're doing and a lot of information um, on the project in general. So yeah, if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm looking for, yeah, uh, those who are watching this on YouTube, uh, you can ask in the chat. I am uh, checking the chat. Uh, and there is anyone have any question? I'm just checking. I have questions. Yeah. Yeah. My first first question on the last picture. What are you doing on that picture, for example? The last. Oh, the very last picture. The um, very that, last picture. Yeah, I was picking cloudberries in Norway. <laughs> ah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, maybe you mentioned, yeah. but I don't remember that. Uh, what did you use? for the scent, we to use, have a scent yeah. uh, for the model. Mm -hmm. We had, we worked with hunters to get fresh pelts of bears and we worked with Milieu Directorat, which is the environmental agency of Norway to get the wolf pelts. So these pelts were frozen to keep the scent and we thaw them and use them for our studies. Um, they, they still have a very strong scent of the animal. And so we just rub that on the pelt and it's apparently enough for the cows to smell it even from far away. It was uh, very impressive and wind direction was also very important in those experiments. Yeah. My other question that um, uh, is, so the high of the, the model, there is, there is the car, there is a model on it and, and it's higher than a living individual. Mm -hmm. uh, is this fact have, uh, what do you think, this is influencing the whole uh, experiment or or the scent is, is the most important thing? I mean, I think visually this is as good of a substitute as we can do. It's obviously not moving in a natural fashion. It's a bit higher than uh, it should be. But I think that they still get a signal that this might be a threat. So I think that if we're not going to be able to use, you know, normal encounters, actual real encounters, this is the best, this is the best mm -hmm. second option. Um, and there's been other experiments that have tried this on sheep and they were doing something where they were pulling, um, they had attached just a, like a little wagon cart, uh, mm -hmm. not radio controlled. They had attached fishermen, um, uh, it's not rope, whatever they use for fishing, it's dummy because on. it's yeah, because it's invisible. And they were pulling in between these two tents they had uh, on their setup, pulling the cart. So that's even less natural. I mean, it's um, we do the best that we can do with a substitute. We just uh, saw that scent seems to be extremely important in recognizing danger. And there's a lot of studies, not not so many on cattle, but a lot of studies. Um, um, on also wildlife that have tested, like how do they react to smells and how do they react to um, visuals and what what are they what senses are they using to recognize danger? And um, 
visual seems to not be the first, first one. Scent seems to be the most important. Yeah. Hey, we have a question from Peter. Thank you for the informative presentation. My question is that any livestock mortality was reported in the study areas or such a thing didn't happen in the last three years? Mm -hmm. um, there are, so sheep mortality is reported to the government. There's a lot less cattle mortality that happens in our area. We did actually have a wolf attack happen during our study. Um, but the problem was that the farmer had some timing of, of calf birthing, of calving, uh, that was too late. And so some of these cows, instead of having calves that were big enough to be sent into the forest, they went into the forest pregnant, gave birth into the forest so that the farmer had no idea how many calves were born. And um, the environmental agency picked up, they had cameras before and after a river that was near uh, this farm. They picked up um, two wolves that were going towards the farm with empty stomachs and no blood on the snout and coming back with full stomachs, I think the leg of a calf and blood all over their mouth. So we know that attacks have happened, but unfortunately for this one, they can't really report it because they don't know how many how many calves were born, how many calves were taken into this particular situation. Um, but the government has um, uh, livestock mortality statistics uh, in the area. And every time the farmers experience a mortality that they think is from carnivores, the um, special carnivore unit from the environmental agency uh, come and investigate and they can confirm if it was indeed a carnivore or not, mm -hmm. if that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have questions? Checking the YouTube. And if you have any more questions that come up later, please don't hesitate to just send an email, I'll be happy to answer. Okay. First, second. Last chance? <laughs> okay, nobody else. Yeah, thank you, Laura. It was a yeah. really good presentation. It was really thank exciting. And I am looking for the, the new papers and, and Yeah, results. I will definitely keep you posted and we can do another one an update of this uh, presentation in a year or something. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, then guys, this is the finish. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye.